Hi, everybody. I just want to welcome you to today's conversation with Paul Gigo. I'm Eliana Johnson. I'm the editor in chief of the Washington Free Beacon and also an alumna of the Hertog Foundation. And I'm looking forward to today's conversation. Um, Paul is the longtime ed editor of the editorial page at the Wall Street Journal. Um, if you haven't been reading, the journal editorial page, you should start now. Um, but before Paul took on that job, he was a reporter both in the US and abroad. He started at the journal in 1980, reporting from Chicago, and in 1982 became the journal's Asia correspondent where he was based in Hong Kong. In 1987, he came back to the DC swamp and wrote a weekly column on politics, Potomac Watch which won the 2000 Pulitzer Prize for commentary. Uh, in the first half of this conversation, I'll kick things off by asking Paul a few questions, and then I'll turn it over to three political studies fellows who uh, sent in questions in advance. And then if we have time, uh, I'd like to take questions from our wider audience. You can submit those questions via Zoom's Q&A function. And if your question is selected, I'll recognize you to ask it. Uh, no need to wait. You're, uh, you can submit your questions whenever you have them. All right. Um, Paul, you began your career as a reporter before moving to the paper's opinion side. How did that background in reporting uh, influence your opinion writing? And for the students and young people listening, would you recommend aspiring opinion writers start as reporters? Uh, well, uh, first of all, Eliana, you're making me feel really old with that recitation of my chronology uh, of my career starting so, so long ago. So, um, uh, but that's the way it is. <laughs> so you can't dodge, uh, dodge the truth. Um, yeah, I did start as a reporter. I, I think it was very helpful to me uh, uh, for because uh, you learn uh, certain skills, you learn how to report, uh, you learn how to do interviews, you learn uh, a certain uh, BS detector, frankly, <laughs> when you talk to people who's lying to you and who isn't. Uh, so when you're a young uh, journalist, uh, building that skill set is really important. Um, and then I think it helps in the sense that when you're when you I think the best opinion writing is not just merely getting up in the morning and telling people what you think that day about what headline you you, you read that morning it's really about informing because you're asking readers to uh, share one of the most precious things they have which is time and if they're going to spend a couple of minutes with you and your column or your editorial uh, you got to give them something of value and that means uh, information and putting facts that you collect as a, as a journalist into, into an opinion writing can help deliver value for people and make it seem as if they believe that their, their time is, is well spent. So collecting facts, putting it together, sorting the relevant from the irrelevant is all very important for, for uh, opinion writing as much as it is for just general reporting even though you have the luxury in opinion writing of crafting an argument to make a point, with a point of view. Do I think that it would be valuable to people uh, to do it? I think it can be valuable, yes. Uh, it was for me to have that start. I have, my staff is split. Kim Strassel started as a reporter. Uh, Dan Henninger started as a reporter. Uh, but some of the others just started on my team. Uh, uh, so it's a mix. You don't have to do it. Uh, but I found it valuable, and I think I think as long as you come into writing opinion with the understanding that, as my former colleague, late colleague Joe Rago used to say, nobody cares what you think. <laughs> they want to know what you can tell them <laughs> about the world, and that's the most important thing. Nobody cares what you think is uh, something I often am telling a lot of the people who work for me, but I, I agree with you. Um, I I think um, the success of conservatism in opinion-driven mediums like talk radio and cable television has uh, made a lot of people overlook the importance of doing reporting as a conservative and of building up those skills. And I, I always tell the young people who come to me saying they aspire to be 
a Charles Krauthammer or a Paul Gigo or a George Will that they would be shocked to find out how much reporting goes into excellent uh, editorials and op-eds. Um, moving on, the budget deficit hit an all-time monthly high in June, um, spending outpaced revenue by $864 billion. Uh, Senate Republicans are now skittish about spending more on a stimulus uh, to counteract the impact of the coronavirus. What are your thoughts on how the government should navigate these challenges? Uh, how do they balance trying to support the economy in crisis, but also thinking about the long-term impact of debt on the country, which is something that uh, on your page you write about frequently? Well, uh, first of all, you have to understand these are politicians and the election is three and a half months away. So long term for them is November 4th. Uh, and uh, that's pre preeminently what's on their mind. I mean, I, you don't have to be a cynic to, to understand that. <laughs> I, I think that, uh, uh, but if you think about it from, a, from, a, from a, an economic point of view, what's the best for the economy now? What's the best to help us get through this obviously very difficult period? I mean, I think you have you have to start with the fact that Congress has passed something like two point seven trillion dollars worth of uh, of, of uh, relief, coronavirus relief so far. Uh, much of that has not been spent. It's still waiting there to be spent. Uh, and uh, much of it is uh, about five hundred billion has gone to the Federal Reserve for a lot of facilities for lending uh, to different parts of the economy, state and local governments. And a lot of that firepower is still waiting on the sidelines uh, and still has not been used. So uh, then you have, so balancing that you have on July 31st, the unemployment insurance uh, fill up that the federal government uh, passed $600 a week, that ends. So what do we need to do uh, between now to, to get through the, 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 the next period? My view would be, I don't know that we need to do anything. Uh, and if it were my recommendation, I would probably say, I don't think you need to pass anything in particular right now. What we need to do is try to make sure we don't do any more harm to, to the economy as the, as the economy begins to reopen, sometimes in fits and starts, but begins to reopen. Let's make sure that there's incentive for people to go back to work. That means you don't want to pass the $600 fill up again on the federal government because it, it you know, the several, the, the Congressional Budget Office says that that means that five out of six American workers make more by staying home than they do by going to, the, to work. So what we're finding this an anomalous situation where we have unemployment rate of 11.1% and companies around the country, we're seeing anecdotal evidence and statistical evidence, they can't find them workers. It's in construction, in retail, hospitality. So you gotta get those incentives right. Uh, you know, if you if 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 they're going to pass something, I'd make it address to healthcare, help on testing, accelerate testing, maybe do help on on contact tracing for for the virus. But uh, I would not do much more. But I recognize again, the long term for them is November third, and they will do something, and it's probably going to be very expensive. And my condolences to all of you, because. You're the ones who will be paying for it <laughs> the rest of your lives because we're racking up uh, record debt. We're going to be at 100% of GDP uh, in American publicly held debt before too long. And uh, the tax uh, taxes are going to go up uh, probably as soon as next year. So not maybe not on you, but uh, on me. And, uh, uh, and I think that it's going to be a, it, we're, we're digging ourselves a fairly significant hole here. You mentioned the $600 unemployment um, bonus that was passed as part of the first uh, tranche of coronavirus relief. And I, re I remember when that went through, uh, there were a few Republican senators who warned that this would disincentivize um, work. It seems to me that if Republicans come out and say what you just said, um, which is they can't pass it again. They will take a lot of political heat before the election. What's the argument that you would 
um, encourage them to make? What do you think is the most persuasive argument that a voter would be receptive to? Well, I think the, the, you start with the fact that we want to get people back to work. Uh, and uh, the way to do that is to make sure that um, we have more jobs available to people. And we want to make sure that people, they're not, people aren't lazy, but they're also not stupid. And it's probably not the best way to put it politically, but it's, uh, you know, people want to work, I think, and they need the incentive to do it. So you want to construct something that, uh, uh, in a way that gives people an incentive to get back to work, helps them with, with a real emergency. I mean, if you're genuinely laid off, you do want help, but we have a state system of, of, uh, of uh, unemployment benefits in place. It uh, works from anywhere from a third to, to two thirds of supplements uh, as a sub wage substitute for the time you need it. Uh, that works pretty well. Let's do that uh, first. Let's make sure that that works. And if states run out of money for that fund, they can always borrow from the federal government. They do it, California, I think, just did it recently. So the funds are there to help people in genuine need, but you also need a functioning economy. And we need the, the, the most important thing for people is to make sure that they can get back to work and, uh, uh, and supplement themselves. We've been, these, these federal programs have been about essentially income replacement. And uh, uh, there's not enough money in the world to keep paying that for, 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 for several more months. What you need is a private economy that pays people for their productivity and their work. And, that, uh, 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 and that's what we have to get back to uh, and get back to that economy we had and that job market we had in uh, January and February where we had record low unemployment. Look, I'm not a politician. Uh, that may not be a very persuasive argument, but uh, you put me on the spot, it's the best I could do. <laughs> but they're reading your page. They're all reading I mean, your page. Yeah, have. I mean, this is the tension. We, we, you know, at the journal, we operate in, in many ways at the nexus of politics and ideas. So we do have to be mindful of what, uh, what ha the political marketplace can bear. We try to keep that in mind. On the other hand, what we can't do is abandon f fundamental economic facts or principles, iron rules of incentives, which don't vanish simply because the politicians wave their wand and say, be gone. <laughs> they still exist. I want to ask you a little bit more about that. But first, um, I want to shift gears. Um, I want to sh shift gears a bit and ask you about editorials. In the conversations that I've had with people at um, at the New York Times and the Washington Post, I, I hear some agitation uh, about that there should be fewer unsigned institutional editorials written. Um, the argument being that they don't really drive the conversation and we should give more space to individual voices. Uh, the journal's editorials have to me always seemed um, not only compelling, but influential. It seems to me that people pay attention to what's written on that page far more than they do to what the editors of the New York Times or the Post are saying. What do you think has made uh, journal editorials effective? And how do, how do you, with your team, decide on what positions and arguments to deploy in them? Hmm. Well, you know, I, I, I appreciate the, 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 the nice words about our editorials. I think the influence uh, point is, is something that is hard to pinpoint because you never can, you don't really see necessarily editorial A appears and B is the result. Sometimes the ideas percolate through the politics and the media and kind of in ways you don't expect and pop up that way. It, it's, it's an anecdotal process as much as anything. Um, what we do have is data. Uh, and our data shows that our editorials are read. Uh, just today, for, I get, I get real-time data. Uh, uh, you probably do too. I get real-time data on what is being read uh, uh, as it happens, who, where people are coming from to see our pieces. Are they coming from different social media sites? Are they coming from WSJ.com? Are they coming from an iPad or a, uh, a phone or a, or, a, or a laptop? I can see that real time. So the number one piece on our website today, although the whole website, not just the opinion page, but the whole website 
is our lead editorial on the California shutdown. Okay. Second most important, second most read piece on the, on the, on the uh, page today is the lead feature by Phil DeMuth on Biden's tax plan. Okay. So believe me, my, my, my bosses are unsentimental about, uh, about commerce. And if we didn't sell papers, they wouldn't allocate the space to the opinion pages that they do. And, and we have to, I have to constantly look at the product we offer and say, okay, is that working? Maybe not. Is that working? Okay, yeah, let's double down on that or let's find a new way to do, to do, to do that. And uh, the editorials work uh, and not every one of them, but by and large they do. And I think one of the, th the way we think about them is that daily journalism is a conversation with readers every day. And you're going back and you're having that conversation. And what the editorials do, we run three in print and sometimes four online. What they do is they give us an opportunity to weigh in on a variety of subjects, uh, sometimes at length, sometimes briefly, that gives people a sense of daily events and lets us have that conversation with them. That's, I think, the first thing. Second is the point I made earlier about information. We have our own sources. Uh, some days you simply have to respond to the news and you need to be topical and topicality is really important. But on today's editorial in California, for example, was written by a young woman named Alicia Finley, who's been following the virus for us. And, uh, you know, she's just voracious in accumulating data and um, we had a conversation at one of our weekly editorial meetings yesterday, and I asked her to expound on where we were, uh, and she did. And I basically said, uh, so uh, Alicia, why don't you write that up? And let's, why don't you, you know, weave in some of the stuff we were talking about as a group? Uh, and she did, and she just had that data. So it was a very informative piece and it did seem to have a point of view. Uh, and the day before, actually, she wrote another editorial, which was the second most read piece on the, on the page, on the whole, uh, the whole um, uh, WSJ.com on the going back to school. Uh, so the, uh, it's um, I mean, informative, uh, topical, uh, engagement with readers. And then I think we do benefit, uh, Eliana, we do benefit from, frankly, from from a niche, uh, we just, I mean, everybody else, you know, is, is the same. The Times, the Post, the FT, Bloomberg, I mean, they all, they're all alike. So if you want a distinctive point of view in a, in a, in a, in a daily publication, uh, I mean, there are a lot of online publications, there's a lot of competition for what we do, but in terms of, you know, kind of the mainstream uh, uh, brand name journalism uh, newspapers, we're the we're the alternative, and I think that helps us helps us a lot. And then the other thing point I'd make, which I think is a comparative advantage, is that a lot of the conservative press, um, and they don't do it badly. I, this is not a criticism, but they focus on politics and culture and Washington, some foreign policy and the economics is a place where we have, I think, a value added and we, we, we have, a, have some expertise built up. So we can, I think a lot of people will turn to us for, for, for that as well. So those are kind of where I, I think uh, um, where we're coming from. The other point I would make is, is, is about craft. Um, I mean, journalism is really, a, it's, it's, a, it's a craft job. You know, it, it's, it's about, um, um, uh, learning how to do something in a compelling way, tell a story in a compelling way. And uh, one of the things I tell my writers, and I learned this from my uh, teachers over time, my mentors is, um, strip down the adverbs, strip down the adjectives, strip down the shoulds and woulds and, and you know, shoulds and musts and oughts. And uh, people don't wanna be beaten over the head and told what to think. They want, to, 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 they want tools and information and arguments to decide what they think for themselves. 
And it's that one of the things, the weaknesses of a lot of editorials is, is they're just so darn orders from headquarters. You know, it's, it's, you need to think like this or you are a moral cretin. And, uh, uh, and that doesn't work because people get tired of it. They, people are smart, right? People want to make up their own mind. Uh, give them the tools. Don't, uh, don't give them orders. <laughs> yeah. One of the best, uh, one of the best pieces of advice uh, that I got from my first job at the New York Sun, uh, where my boss was a Wall Street Journal veteran, Seth Lipsky, uh, was along these lines that um, very simple writing tips, like if something is continuing, it is not news. Um, be very <laughs> careful. Uh, <laughs> Seth loved to say that. And, uh, but I want to follow up on one of the things that you said, which is that the journal um, provides an alternative point of view. It struck me that the, to me, the page is interesting because um, of its unpredictability to a certain extent. There's some tension there about um, watching for when the journal is going to criticize uh, Republicans and conservatives. And I wanted to get your thoughts on, is that something you're conscious about doing? Uh, do you think it distinguishes you? And are we at risk of having um, a, a press that is entirely predictable, where that tension, tension goes out because uh, the New York Times is losing conservatives and uh, among many other outlets. But I'm curious to get your thoughts on, on that. Well, it's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, I am, uh, I, I, I don't, we don't set out to say, oh, well, we're, we, we got to have a certain number of times we criticize uh, Republicans or Trump. Um, who some people would say, oh, well, you know, you're, you t those are your, your guys. I, I don't look at it that way. I mean, I, I look at the presidency as the presidency, and we're going to uh, criticize the, or support the president based on the policy uh, and based on, uh, uh, on the, the fundamentals, I mean, the merits. And it's the same with, uh, uh, with the Republican Party at the state or in, 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 in Congress. Um, so you have to, so I, I, that's the way I, I, I think of it. Um, I mean, the, there is some more tension now. There's no question more tension in our relationship with this administration than in, for example, the Bush administration, because you know, it veers in pronounced ways from our longstanding views on issues like trade and immigration and, uh, uh, and a robust American foreign policy. Uh, so, you know, there's been ten tension there, no question. And I think, uh, uh, you know, we, we've, we certainly let the administration have it on, on those subjects uh, from time to time. And uh, as well as, of course, the, the, the Trump character issue, which is, uh, you know, I could write about that every day if, you, if I had the space. But the, the, the issue is, uh, uh, so, I mean, we're, we're going to, uh, you know, it's not something I think we go out consciously to do. Uh, but, you know, if, it's nice if we can, you know, if we find a, a Democrat who, for example, has a, a, an idea we agree with, great, let's praise them. And at the same time, I don't hesitate to, we don't hesitate to criticize uh, this White House or Republicans if we think that uh, they're doing something that is, uh, is going to be bad for the country. Thank you. I think that's a helpful explication. Um, I want to turn it over to a few of the students now, um, rather than take up all the time myself. And first, uh, I have Jack Bearer, who just graduated from Wake Forest University and is, uh, is now at the Free Beacon. Jack, all you. It's a, it's a conspiracy here. You got all these exactly. guys on your team. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Eliana. It's uh, good to see you outside of virtual work here. Um, so for Paul, thank you uh, for this talk. It's been really, really interesting so far. So my question is sort of similar to what you're talking about with um, your relationship with the administration and where you think conservatism is going. So um, current polls really show Vice President Biden and most Democratic Senate candidates, for that matter, uh, beating the GOP um, pretty handily in November. So if this trend holds, which obviously it may not, but 
uh, if it does, um, how would this law shape the Republican Party and conservative intellectual movement at large? Uh, will the party go in a direction more recommended by the 2012 um, election postmortem, or would it sort of continue on with this infusion of uh, populism, industrial policy, and skepticism of uh, American global leadership? Just love to hear any insights you might have about um, where this is all going. <laughs> Uh, well, if I knew the answer to that, uh, I probably would be at a beach somewhere retired <laughs> and because I would be making a lot of money uh, somehow in the, in the next few years betting on, on where things are going. I, I think it's, it's really impossible to know uh, where it goes. I, I, do, I think one thing I, uh, well, first of all, one thing I learned from 2016 was uh, humility because uh, I was among the legions who did not think Donald Trump would win. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I, I, I think predictions are uh, perilous uh, in this very, very dynamic political and economic environment we're in. But let's say Trump loses, uh, which I agree with you, if the polls are right, he would get crushed right now, um, and Republicans would lose the Senate. So one thing I think you can say for certain is that it's unlikely that we are going to return to the status quo ante. I mean, I don't think anybody who thinks that uh, people are going to, the, that the, the parties are going to return to some pre-Trump uh, situation is wrong because Trump has happened. His administration has happened. He has identified certain things about the American electorate that are real, uh, uh, a certain economic populism, a, 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 a cultural polarization uh, between the parties that is growing ever wider, it seems to me. And I think that, that those dynamics are going to prevail. You have a political realignment taking place where uh, suburban moderate Republicans are moving into the Democratic column. We saw that in 2018, we've seen it in some of the off elections. I think much of that will be permanent, particularly among women. Uh, I think uh, uh, I think that uh, Trump's appeal to the white working uh, class voter is a real phenomenon and is likely to uh, have uh, uh, have legs beyond Trump. You'll see you already see um, a variety of of potential 2024 contenders: uh, Josh Hawley, Marco Rubio, um, uh, uh, Tom Cotton. Uh, others all angling for little elements of that Trump voter group. And I think you'll see that even more asserting itself. On the other hand, you have somebody like Nikki Haley, who was also likely to run looking to be more of a traditional economic conservative in some of her positioning right now. So the Republican Party will have a ferocious debate if Trump loses over the causes of his defeat over, I mean, are they, were they solely about Trump? Or were they something about his, his polarized style of governance, about his, uh, some of his agenda? Did it not work? Uh, uh, and, uh, or is it, uh, or, I mean, and there's gonna be various issues that are, that are debated. You see a, a variety of Republicans who are giving up on on essentially the, the small government message and saying we need to have uh, a dirigiste economic policy for, but it's for our voters, not for their voters, not for elite coastal uh, elite, liberal elites, but for our working class families. So that, that tension is gonna exist, it's gonna go on. And then the, you know, the, the other big question is, let's assume you're right uh, and uh, it's a democratic sweep, how well can the Democratic Party govern with a uh, what I think is would be the most leftward, left-wing agenda uh, we've seen since uh, maybe '64 to '66? Much further to the left than 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 pre the Obama years. So can they can they govern successfully with that agenda? If they do, they can craft a new majority. Uh, you might infer from my uh, analysis that I have my doubts. Thanks, Paul. Uh, next, I want to go to Vienna Scott, uh, who is at Yale. Hi, 
right. Well, thank you for being here with us. Um, I want to shift to another kind of journalism question. I'm really interested in the journal editorial report. I think it's such a fascinating project. I would love to know why you began this project. Um, how do you understand its role in educating the public? Is there a pedagogical function in teaching TV audiences how to be consumers of print journalism? It's such an interesting synthesis of those kind of two different news worlds. Um, Interesting, yeah. interesting. Um, television and pedagogy, not two words often used <laughs> in the same question. Uh, but uh, uh, I think, um, I mean, just the way we started, I, I, uh, I'd done a lot of television when I was in Washington uh, of a variety of, of kinds, particularly on the news hour with uh, then with Jim Lehrer. And um, then I got this job, came up here, gave that up, but I got a, I got a, a, a re, re, people at PBS reached out to me and said, hey, you know, how would you like to put together an hour long program on PBS? And so uh, with some help from my business colleagues at the journal, we did, we put together a program. It's probably a mistake uh, because never, never get in bed with the government. Believe me, never, ever, ever. Okay, that's a lesson I learned from that. But what it did do is it gave us a, uh, a the core of a program that we'd done for about a year and uh, and along the lines that we are still doing and after a year I decided because of the difficulties internally at PBS and getting distribution and so on that I pulled the plug on that but the people at Fox had been noticing and and they called me and said uh, hey how, how'd you like to take that show to Fox and I said okay let's talk so we did, and uh, and we put it together, uh, and uh, um, uh, with the help of some producers at Fox, they uh, improved my uh, performance level by about a thousand percent, and um, and uh, sharpened it, gave it a quicker kind of uh, cable news pace. But they allowed us they allow us to set the agenda, they allow us to have a, uh, a, a different kind of style than you see on a lot of the Fox programs. And we have, I've had, we have uh, my producer, Regina Rogers, has been with us since we started in 2000, January of 2006. So she's, she, gets, she gets everything of how we do it. And uh, uh, she writes the scripts for me. And uh, we have a couple of meetings a week where we discuss the programs and the guests and what do we want to talk about. And it's really, and then we tape it, uh, you know, on Friday or sometimes live on Saturday. And uh, it's, it's really, I mean, I do it because um, it's just another way to reach people, right? It's, an, I mean, there are a lot of people who don't read uh, newspapers, don't read the journal, but they do get their information and news delivered through television. And there are a lot of people who use audio, which is a, a podcast, which is why we have a podcast now. So you want to use those multiple platforms to reach people. And the journal audience and the Fox audience, believe it or not, are not the same. There are a lot of, there's not a lot, there's some overlap, but there's not as much as you'd think. So this gives me an opportunity to for, have our message, uh, journalism projected to a different group of people. And then the other reason I, I do it is, um, is uh, we do it is because it helps it frankly it's a good uh, management tool for me because it helps my young staff you know a lot of them who write anonymously as editorial writers don't get the the psychic income if you will of of fame and fortune that you do if you write a blog or if you're the editor of the free bacon or if you are one of these you know you got to get your name out so somebody who writes like uh uh Oh, Jason Willick, who writes about f Facebook and censorship on the press for, 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 in, uh, in platforms for me. Uh, he comes on TV and people see him and I can A, give him a little more money for it and B, they go, oh yeah, you're that kid, you're the guy. And it, 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 and, and, and it also helps get their, their, their presentation abilities in terms of verbal delivery improved and that's a great skill to have over the course of a journalistic lifetime so that's all the uh, it's probably a lot more information than you wanted but that's sort of my calculation in, in, in doing it 
Paul, you talked about the verbal delivery and it's something that I go uh, on about because I think that our system of education emphasizes writing so much, not that it does a great job of teaching people how to write, but there isn't as much emphasis on verbal communication. Can you just say something briefly about why you, why you think it's so important that young people learn uh, to deliver their ideas verbally? Well, um, I, you know, I think it's so much more important than it was when I started, uh, just because right now there's the, 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 the visual platforms of not just television or not just cable, but, but, uh, but video uh, delivery of messages on websites um, and on, uh, on audio is, is the way that people get their news. And, you know, there's a lot of people who say, well, in the future with AI, uh, that's the only way people are going to get news. We're not going to, uh, you know, the, the, that text is going to vanish um, as well, ultimately. I, you know, I, that's a long way away if it ever happens. But I think that uh, you need, and, and, and it just can help you make your case, uh, if you have the ability to distill uh, a, a message uh, into... Um, into, uh, uh, into a crisp way that you can deliver it uh, on television or in audio. I know one of, the, one of the, the bits of advice I got when I first started on TV is you use print to, uh, to, to figure out what you think, and then you go and you shrink it and find a clever phrase if you can and then that's what you use on TV. And the two people I, I, I most learned from in that regard were George Will and Charles Krauthammer because they were both experts at concision and verbal concision and the, the colorful phrase. And I never have matched their abilities, but it's, uh, uh, it, it's something that I think just helps you communicate, helps you deliver the message, and it can help uh, younger people in a career as they develop, look, I mean, it's, it's like, uh, it's like, uh, you know, a hitter who can also uh, field and hit for power and hit for average, you know, the more valuable player, somebody who can write well, report well, uh, and also speak well is just a more valuable, uh, is going to have them uh, have more prospects in their career. I've got one more student question that I want to take before opening it to the wider audience. Uh, Dominic Pino from George Mason University. Hello there. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. I've really enjoyed uh, your talk so far. Um, my question is uh, about an earlier stage in your career. Uh, you both lived and worked in Hong Kong, and so as a result of that, I'm sure you have um, much better knowledge of their, their culture and their situation than most Americans do. Uh, and I was wondering if um, if you were if you've been at all surprised by uh, the mainland China's actions in the recent months, and if there's anything that you think the United States can do to help out the people of Hong Kong. Yeah. The, uh, well, thank you for that question. One of the things that I mean, Hong Kong is one of the places in the world that I love the best. Uh, I lived there for six years, and uh, you know, I played. Uh, uh, I played uh, uh, basketball there with one of the club teams. I just got to know the culture really well. I loved it. It, it was a, just a reservoir of freedom and an ex example of freedom, particularly when I first went over there was in 1979. It was really just at the onset of Deng Xiaoping's reforms in China. And um, uh, then in 1984, I was there when Margaret Thatcher came over after she signed the joint declaration. She sold it to us, and I was at the press conference where she defended it. And we were skeptical about it from the start, ho hopeful, but, but also saying, and I, I, I just reread the editorial I wrote in 1984 on this. Uh, uh, you know, again, it's uh, showing my age. But, the, uh, but, you know, we basically said this was a be promise from Beijing when they, they were making this promise about we would honor one country, two systems. And we said that communist governments don't have a, a great track record of keeping their promises. And, um, and then there, there, there was, you know, so we, we had our doubts. Uh, 
And uh, that led to a, a fairly famous exchange when Maggie Thatcher came to, to, see my, to see us in New York, sat across the table and gave us a ferocious lecture about the error of our ways in, 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 in our editorials on Hong Kong. And then she leaned across the table and said, am I making myself clear? Which, uh, if you've ever seen some of the history shows about Mrs. Thatcher, it's an intimidating presence <laughs> uh, and, a, and a memorable exchange. But I mean, I think the, I, I, then I remember I went back in 1970, 1997 uh, to Hong Kong. I went with a couple, I went with Joe Lieberman and Connie Mack, a couple of senators, and we got, we got taken all over Hong Kong and then up to Beijing. And there was a lot of hope at the time that the reform impulse in China would kind of be swept up by the prosperity of Hong Kong and, and would essentially, Hong Kong would take over the mainland in, a, in, a, in, a, in terms of ideas. And uh, we found that that has not happened. Uh, the opposite has happened and the Communist Party just doesn't want to give up power. And so in that sense, uh, you know, I, think, I, I think it's a tragedy for the world myself, I really do. I think it's, it's enormously troubling. Uh, I have many friends there. Uh, I hope they'll get to go to the UK or that the US will be smart enough to scoop up some of that talent. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, you know, maybe they can move to California and shape up the politics of California. But uh, the, the uh, uh, because these are not, you know, social welfare advocates, okay? These are people who, yeah, I mean, I, 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 my former secretary now lives in Australia. My translator, uh, the guy, my teacher who taught me Mandarin, uh, lived in, lives in California. So <laughs> some are already here. But, um, but uh, I, I, I think it's going to be bad. I mean, I think that, uh, that Hong Kong is essentially going to end in, in, in the ways that we've known it. It's going to become uh, much more uh, part of the mainland. Uh, uh, and uh, I think it's a tragedy for the world to lose that seven and a, and a half million people in that, that, that free corner of the world. And I think it portends badly for uh, the, what I think is going to be the coming uh, confrontation, uh, or maybe that's too strong a word, but the coming competition uh, of ideas between an authoritarian China as it tries to spread its, uh, its model uh, and, and, and American Western uh, values. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I wanna open it to the audience now. Um, we have uh, first up Nico Donahue from American University. Yes, hi, thanks so much for uh, giving us a chance to ask these questions to you. Uh, your description of journalism and uh, opinion writing as a daily conversation with the reader struck me. I think it cor it's correct and it highlights uh, the writer's role in civic discussion. And so I'm wondering if you have any advice for those looking to pursue this path to successfully engage with readers who may not initially agree with their position. Uh, how can we use this role effectively to revive a culture of civic discussion, which now faces evident decline? Well, you, you, you tossed me an easy one. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, it's difficult. The, 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 so much of the current discourse and, and frankly, the current, the, the way the media is currently structured uh, encourages polarization because if you're speaking to the, to, you can see it on Twitter, right? You have right, right wing Twitter and left wing Twitter and both of them are in many ways echo chambers and you get more tweets if you, uh, if you can say something that's, you know, polarizing and you get more, get more followers. And the same is true with, uh, with uh, uh, some of the blog sites, they're looking, you, they carve out a market niche based on polarization. And um, I think the risk with that is that that makes you less likely as a journalist to be able to disagree with the home team. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I can see it in some of our, uh, my, our, our, the mail I get, the email I get attention from our readers, you know, it, our audience, we, we have a little more, the journal has a little, the luxury of a more broader, of a broader, more diverse audience because of our business pedigree. 
So, um, you know, we have a strong Trump faction. We have, uh, we have a, a lot of Democrats. And then we have probably, I'd say, you know, 30%, or this is a rough estimate, of folks that probably share uh, some of Trump's policy ideas, but think he's, uh, uh, how should we say, problematic as a human being and as a political leader. Uh, and, uh, uh, but boy, you criticize Trump and they let you have it. You know, you are, a, ah, there you go again, as you go, you're the never Trumper. You know, there you go, your true colors come out. Probably all those buddies of yours on Fifth Avenue who you dine, uh, you know, every other night with, ah, they got to you. You know, I mean, they only knew how boring my life was. The, 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 uh, 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 and then if you, if you say something supportive of Trump because you actually thought his, his uh, Mount Rushmore speech had some merit to it, as we did, then, uh, oh, there you go. You know, you're a sellout. Would you get a lunch at the White House? And it's, it's questioning of motives that I think is, can be so corrosive. How can you as a young person uh, do it? You know, I don't know. I think, I think you got to be true to yourself uh, more than anything else. You have to speak from the heart. You have to be true to your principles. And then I think you'd want to try to find a, a, a publication and a group and, a, and, and editors, some people who can nurture that and, uh, and, and, and find a way to, 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 to nurture that and make yourself, make yourself an expert on something and become a, a, a barometer for people uh, uh, who can go to and say, you know what, that guy's smart. That guy knows this subject cold. And you know, he's also seems to be principled, has point of view maybe, but willing to listen, willing to entertain contrary ideas, uh, even if he disagrees with them. You know, all of that as a package, I think can help you as you go across your career. I think the, 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 the one of the troubles I see is there are not as many places to go and, 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 and do that nowadays as there were when I was, was, was starting. I, I got my start on the night desk, uh, night sports desk of the Green Bay Press Gazette. I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, working the six to midnight shift from January to June in my off terms from college. And uh, let me tell you, I had a boss who said, are you going to produce that copy yet? You're going to get it in? Or not? Well, how long am I going to be here? Uh, and uh, you know, you learn those th those skills, and you also learn how to make sure you never, ever, ever misspell somebody's name in a marriage announcement, a death announcement, uh, or an engagement, or a, a birth announcement, because those are the only three times those people are going to get their names in the paper. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm I'm digressing here, but I I think the I think the 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 you know be true to yourself and develop expertise and, uh, and uh, master, master your subject. So funny, Paula, I think, you know you're doing something right when you are simultaneously slammed as a liberal sellout and a right-wing troglodyte, which is something that uh, I would often get emails from, you know, readers back to back, one person deriding me as, uh, as a sellout and the other as, uh, of course, you know, I'm, giving conservative talking points, uh, which is which can be amusing. Um, the last question I want to take from the audience is uh, from Grace, Grace Fan Jones from St. John's College in Annapolis. Hi. Um, so it seems to me that, you know, arguably the East Coast is the heart of the political activity in the nation. But I'm wondering, how does reporting from a place like Chicago, that's obviously a prominent and I'm from Chicago, this is not any, not down talking my hometown, but you know. You're, you're talking your brief here. So how does it, you know, how does moving to the Midwest and reporting from a town like Chicago influence the way one views political activities? And, you know, reporting from abroad also probably, you know, gives an invaluable perspective on events going on in the United States, but is it possible to feel, I guess, a little bit removed from the heart of activity? Uh, well, I think it's always, it's something that you, you have to, uh, have to uh, uh, watch out for uh, when you're in my job. Uh, I think my job has to be done from New York uh, because everybody comes through here. 
politicians come through here to fundraise, global leaders come through for the UN and, uh, on, and on our way to Washington. CEOs come through here because they have financing uh, uh, all around the country. So this is a very good place to, to meet uh, everybody for the job that I do. Now, on the other, uh, I wouldn't want to be based in Washington because I think that can be a little too provincial, a little too much politics. Um, and, uh, but I always feel grateful that I, in this job that I grew up in the Midwest and then had the chance to work in Chicago, um, my whole family still lives in, in Wisconsin or Chicago. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and I was able to had the luxury of going to Asia and traveling around Asia for 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 those years because uh, it was an invaluable perspective on uh, on the United States and uh, gave me an insight into China that I simply would not have. And China, of course, is you know one of the China U.S. relationship will be the most important story of the next half century. Uh, so um, I think. Um, uh, yeah, you always have to guard against provincialism and parochialism, which is one of the reasons that I try to hire people from a variety of places. Uh, Alicia Finley is from Orange County, went to Stanford. Jason Willick is from Santa Clara. Adam O'Neill is from Irvine, California. He's now in, 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 in Rome uh, for me. Kyle Peterson grew up in uh, Fargo. His family's a farm family, went to Iowa State. Henninger, Dan Henninger grew up in Cleveland. Um, Jillian Melcher grew up in Wyoming, went to Hillsdale. Kate Batchelder uh, grew up in Michigan and uh, she now lives in Virginia and she contributes from there. So we have a variety of people. I think that's important to do. Mene Ukaburua, uh, he's more East Coast guy. He, he, he's from Princeton uh, uh, and uh, went to an Ivy League school, uh, which we don't hold against him. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, but so you want to have that variety and you want to have people who, who don't think all alike, uh, don't have the same experience. Um, and I think that can enrich your conversation. It can enrich the coverage and people will say, uh, you know, I heard this I, from people I never would have met. Uh, so it is a, a very important to do that. One of the, one of the, things I worry about for my colleagues in their 20s is are they going to have the same experiences, the same opportunities that I have had? And one of my duties is to try to make sure to the extent I can that they do. Thank you. Uh, you guys are hearing from a Minnesotan and a Wisconsinite, so Heartland is, uh, is representing today. Um, Paul, I, I'm under strict orders to end uh, at 2 p.m. sharp, so I want to close by just asking you one more question, which is, what is the political development that's most surprised you uh, that you've seen unfold in your, in your career? Um, yeah, that's not an easy question because there's a lot of them. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the surprise is probably defined uh, uh, much of my career. Um, um, I guess one of the major ones was, uh, and, and this is because I grew up as a child of the Cold War, and you know, it was just the, the Russian, the Soviet US confrontation was just simply a fixture. And so much of how we thought about foreign affairs was defined through that, that history. And, and um, and then in an instant, poof, it was gone. 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall. I never thought it would come down that fast. And then within two years, the Soviet Union fell uh, and broke up and the Warsaw Pact faded away. Germany was unified and all without a shot, uh, all peacefully. And I suppose that maybe is the biggest, the biggest surprise because it, and I shouldn't have been surprised, right? We always look back in hindsight and say, well, why didn't you see the signs? Uh, Reagan did. <laughs> but nonetheless, when you're, when you're raised to think about a subject in a certain way, then it, then it all melts away so rapidly. Uh, it's, it, it, it's, it's surprising. And I think it's a lesson that uh, uh, the, the, the stasis that you see now 
is uh, uh, is not uh, is not the uh, uh, is not it won't will not last. What you see now will change, and uh, I guess the other thing is is not one single event. It's more the it's the digital revolution, and what it has wrought, uh, and and is and is continuing to bring. It's just so overwhelming in its degree of technological change. Uh, and what it's done for my line of work. Again, this is showing my age, but when I was a foreign correspondent for in, in, in Hong Kong, when I would travel, I'd go for two, three weeks at a time to a country, and I'd bring a little portable Letra 32 typewriter. That's what I wrote on. Okay, I wrote in half, on eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper, and I would take, I would go back to my hotel room, I'd write up the story, I'd bring it down to the teletype operator who'd send it to New York, I'd get the read back, I'd have to look through and so oh, they made it there to typo. So then I have to send it back and I'd be up until one or two in the morning sometimes, you know, getting the read back from New York since Manila or Jakarta or, you know, Lahore is, was a lot of hours ahead of, uh, ahead of the East coast. And, um, and then they developed this little thing called a portable computer. And I had a Tandy 1000, which was a little black box with two couplers on it when you had phones that were the old phones. Remember those with two ends? If you, if you look at old, you know, phone booths. And all I had to do was type in 16 numbers. And boom, it was in New York, my story. And it was like a miracle. And, uh, and now, of course, you know, there's more, there's, there's more computer power. Uh, in my little phone here than there were in mainframes at the time. But it, it, it's just been such a revolution in how we do things. And uh, mostly for the better, but many days I think social media not for the better. <laughs> I'm with you on that. I'm an enormous uh, advocate of, maybe not the right way to put it, but uh, I think social media carries a uh, a lot more risk than than reward, particularly for reporters. But um, thank you so much, Paul. I think just from hearing you talk, um, all of you listening have probably gotten a window into um, how busy Paul is and therefore how much it means that he took the time to do this. I really appreciate it. And uh, Paul, I think you're one of the first people to describe me as having fame and fortune, uh, something that I, I won't forget soon. Um, and thanks to our audience for joining us. Uh, I think we're wrapping right on time. Uh, so thank you all. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks for the good questions.